In this video, we're going to talk about the basics of the sliding filament model, which is the process in which a muscle cell contracts. And we're also going to throw in some stuff about motor, uh, motor units and motor recruitment. So you also have a concept map on the Blackboard site in which you can fill in the steps that I'm going to go through to make sure that you understand the order they go in. I'll just do a quick review of anatomy. Remember, this is a muscle, this is a muscle fiber. This is a myofibril. Remember, myofibril has these sarcomeres from Z disc to Z disc. We have the actin, which is a thin filament, and the myosin, which is a thick. And we're going to talk about how they interact and how that allows the muscle to contract. The other structure I want to review for you real quick is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, this contains large amounts of calcium. This is going to be important. This is going to be important for the process of muscle contraction. Here's the sarcomere we looked at. Just review. Okay, here's your Z line your other Z line, here's your uh, H zone, your A band, your I band. What's basically going to happen is in a resting situation the myosin and the actin are not going to interact with each other. But when the muscle fiber is stimulated by a motor neuron that's going to allow the myosin cross bridge to grab to the actin and then it's going to pull that actin so our, so our Z lines are going to become closer to each other shortening the sarcomere which is going to shorten the whole fiber. So here's the model I'm going to use here. So here is your Z line, Z line to Z line. We're looking at a sarcomere. Here's your actin, and here's your myosin with your myosin cross bridges. Here is what it looks like if you uh, enlarge the actin. It's a little more complicated than we went over, but what I want you to notice here is on the actin we have what's called an active site. These myosin cross bridges right here, they actually want to bind to that active site. They want to bind to that active site. But in a resting situation, in a resting situation, that active site on actin is closed, so the myosin can't bind. What's going to happen is, again, at rest, the myosin is not bound to the actin. Um, that's key to ca calcium's key to this process. The reason the the active site is closed at rest is because the calcium is in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What's going to open that active site is going to be the presence of calcium. So calcium is going to play a key role in this process of muscle contraction. So at rest, again, the myosin cross bridges are not bound to the actin, so they can't generate tension or generate force. What's then going to happen, and you watch this in another video, is a motor neuron is going to stimulate the muscle fiber. Now what happens when the muscle fiber is stimulated, the calcium that's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to be released into the muscle fiber. And so the calcium is going to be released into the muscle fiber, and what that calcium is going to do, represented by this little orange ball right here, it's going to bind to the actin. And when this calcium binds to the actin, it opens the active site it opens the active site. So what happens is now that the active site is open this myosin can bind to this active site on actin. So it's grabbing on to the actin. Think of it like a tug of war. Think of the myosin cross bridges as your hands and the rope is the actin. And so when the muscle fiber has been stimulated and calcium is released you can now grab on to the rope. The myosin cross bridges can grab on to the actin. So that's step one. Now the next step is, and notice the difference in the myosin cross bridge here, it's, it's what it's done is it's ratcheted. It's pulled on the actin. It's pulled on the actin. What we need for that to occur is called ATP, and we've talked about this, okay? We've talked about ATP. There's a formula I want you to know. It's ATP, ADP plus a phosphate plus energy, okay? Plus energy. Now this is a double arrow, I know it's not the prettiest double arrow, which means the equation can go this way or it can go this way. Okay. But what we need, what we need for that myosin cross bridge to ratchet is we need energy. Okay, we need energy. So what your body's going to do, it's going to take ATP, it's going to take ATP, and it's going to break it down to ADP. Now ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. TRI, so three phosphates. So if we draw a simple model of this molecule, you got three phosphates. You got three phosphates. Here's a phosphate, here's a phosphate, here's a phosphate. Oops, that's a P. This last bond is not very strong. Okay, this last bond is not very strong. So when that bond breaks, when we break a bond, what we get is we get energy. So when we break a bond, we get energy. So when we take this ATP, which is here, and we break this last phosphate off, 
what we end up with is ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, which means two phosphates. We end up with this phosphate right here, but we end up with energy. And what that energy is going to be used for is for this myosin crossbridge to ratchet. So what you'll do have is the myosin crossbridge will attach due to calcium opening the active site, and then it will pull, it will ratchet due to the presence of this energy. And what I want you to notice here is here's your sarcomere, here's your z-line here, and here's your z-line here. Notice the distance between them. And then when the myosin continues to ratchet, when it continues to ratchet, your z-lines get closer together. What's happening now in our tug of war is the myosin is pulling on that, pulling on that actin, and the sarcomere gets shorter. Okay. Now what happens is when a muscle fiber is stimulated, every sarcomere in that muscle fiber is going to shorten. So you have to kind of imagine, if we go back to this drawing, if we go back to this drawing, if this muscle fiber is stimulated and the myosin grabs onto the actin because of calcium and then ratchets because of ATP and getting that energy, every sarcomere, every sarcomere in this myofibril of all these myofibrils is going to shorten which means it's going to pull on the connective tissue we talked about, it's going to pull on the tendon, and it's going to move the bone. Okay, it's going to move the bone. So again, you can use this drawing. At rest, this sarcomere would be at rest. The myosin cross bridges are not bound to the actin. But if the muscle fiber is stimulated, again, we get the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, opens the active site, the myosin then binds, and then when we get the breakdown of ATP, which we talked about here, that energy is used, that energy is used to get those myosin cross bridges to ratchet. Now I want you to think about this concept. I'm asking you a question. When you look here, every myosin is attached to the actin and every myosin is ratcheting. Now, is this the way it really works in the body? I want you to think about that tug of war example. If every person grabbed on with both hands and then pulled, and then pulled, now to pull more, you're going to have to do what? You're going to have to let go and then re-grab on, okay, re-grab on. How is that similar to muscle contraction? Well, in reality, all the myosin cross bridges do not grab and pull and let go at the same time. What will happen is a myosin cross bridge will attach, will ratchet, and then will let go, but they don't all do it at the same time. And again, use the tug of war example. What do you do? You pull with a hand, you then grab with the other hand, you let go with the first hand, you grab on, so you're using usually, usually one hand at a time to pull and to shorten and to pull the other side of the rope. Okay. One other thing I want you to know about contraction is when this myosin binds and then it ratchets, in order for it to let go, in order for it to release, you have to have another ATP. So in order to get productive muscle contraction, each myosin head, you're going to need two ATPs. You're going to need this first ATP to make energy, and then another ATP has to bind to the myosin cross bridge to get it to let go. And then what will happen is that same ATP will be used for energy the next time it pulls, okay, the next time it pulls. So we need two ATPs, and we need calcium. Okay, we need calcium. Now this process will continue. The myosin will grab on, it will ratchet, it will let go. It will continue until the muscle fiber, until the muscle fiber is no longer stimulated by a motor neuron to contract. So how do we relax? How does the muscle relax? What's going to happen is when the motor neuron is no longer stimulating that fiber, this calcium that was released in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to be actively transported, and this should ring a bell to you. It's going to be actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Actively transported. Now, go back into your memory bank. What do I mean by active transport? What has to happen? Active transport means we're going to go against the gradient. So there's going to be a large amount of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, a small amount out, but we have to get this calcium back into that sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we're going to go against the gradient. Remember the VW beetle example. We're going to have to push this calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so our active sites can close. So what does active transport need in order for that to happen, to go from low to high? Guess what you're going to need? You're going to need more ATP. 
Okay, so as you can see, muscle fibers use a lot of energy in order to carry out their job. Okay, in order to carry out their job. So go back over this video if you need to again and look this over in your textbook. A couple other things I want to go over though before we end this video is motor units. Okay. Like I told you in the previous slide, when a single motor neuron stimulates a muscle fiber, that muscle fiber, every sarcomere in that muscle fiber is going to shorten. But what I want you to notice is, here is a motor neuron. I want you to notice how it branches. Okay, you don't have one motor neuron for every fiber, skeletal muscle fiber, in your body. What happens is motor neurons are going to branch. So here you'll see an example. Here's a motor neuron. Notice it branches. It's going to stimulate that fiber, stimulate that fiber, come off here, branch, and stimulate several different fibers. So what a motor unit is, a motor unit is the motor neuron and the fiber that it stimulates. Now some motor units are really big. They branch and they can stimulate thousands of fibers. But when that motor neuron fires, all of those thousand muscle fibers will contract completely. Some motor units are really small. The smallest ones in the body, and I'm not going to tell you where they are because we're going to do it in class, they will only stimulate three to four muscle fibers only three to four muscle fibers. So a motor unit is the motor neuron and the fiber that it stimulates. We'll talk about the practicality of these different size motor units from these ones that may that may stimulate a thousand fibers to the ones that only stimulate three or four. A couple other terms. Motor recruitment is the ability to activate a motor unit. When you contract muscles it is voluntary skeletal muscle is voluntary so you have to think about stimulating motor units so what you have the ability to do you have the ability to recruit motor units and I'm going to give you a practical example if you've ever done if you've ever weight lifted or you do weight lift or you ever start weight lifting um, and I worked with people when they were starting a weight training program one of the things you will see happen is that within those first two to three to four to maybe even to five weeks you will see a significant difference either in the number of times you can lift a weight or the amount of weight you can lift and so what happens during those first five or six weeks people think that their muscle fibers are getting bigger their muscles are getting much bigger and they really aren't what happens during those first several weeks of weight training is your brain learns how to recruit more motor units. Your brain learns how to bring more muscle fibers, to bring more muscle fibers into that process. So it's actually your brain that's being trained more than your muscle fibers. Now if you continue to lift, you know, six weeks to eight weeks and on, then yes, your muscle fibers will start to grow and that process is called hypertrophy. You will develop more actin and myosin fibers because you're, you're kind of going out of homeostasis. You're throwing off homeostasis, and you're, the way your body's going to try to maintain it is to increase the actin and myosin because then you have more actin or more myosin binding to actin. You get more pull, and you get more resistance. So motor recruitment, the ability to activate motor units. And we're actually going to do a case study involving that, a simple one. Muscle tone. Um, there's a certain amount of muscle in your body that is always in a sustained contraction. So as you're sitting at your desk watching this, what muscles of your body are always being contracted to keep you in the position you are? Examples can include the muscles in your neck. Okay. The muscles in your face have muscle tone. So there are always some motor neurons firing, some motor units firing that keep those muscles in a constant contraction. If you lose that ability, like someone has a stroke, one of the symptoms is the, uh, if it, the stroke's on the right side of their brain, the left side of their face will just lose that muscle tone. And that's because those motor neurons aren't firing and the muscle fibers relax. The muscles that work a lot, like the ones in your neck and your lower back and in your face, that's where we tend to take a lot of tension. Because if you're, they're not strong enough, or you're sitting in a certain position for a long period of time, they tend to become fatigued. So those are the areas that we tend to get the most stress in. Okay, make sure you review this and again do the concept mapped on muscle contraction and we'll review it in class.